from the New York City area, welcome to the Badass Counseling Show, where the master badass himself, Sven Erlinson, takes you deep and gives balm for the soul, baby. Hi guys, it is you, it is me, and we are on the Badass Counseling Show podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are tuning in from, whether it's Bradenton, Florida, or up in Rifle, Colorado. We've got people who follow us on in Edmonton, uh, all the way over to uh, bloody old England. It's great to have you here. Uh, we have listeners all around the world, and we are so honored. We always talk about what a treat it is to be able to uh, bring something that hopefully is uh, helping lives. Um, and so I am joined in studio by KC, always in the booth, and Rob the Rocket sitting next to me. Hello, Rob. Hi, Sven. Bloody hell, I have English relatives. It's, uh, it's merry and it's bloody, I must say. Yeah, how about that? Uh, it's funny, Rob. I, w- I want to just before we dive in with our guest today, Eric. Um, I, I had someone comment to me today, uh, someone who listens to our show uh, frequently, and she said, "You know, Sven, I sometimes have to stop the show when I'm listening to it." And I said, "Well, that's okay. You know, sometimes you got to go to an appointment or whatever." And she said, "No, no, no. Sometimes I have to stop the show because when I'm listening to it." the trauma of what this person went through or hearing their story is just more than I can handle. And so I just have to stop it. I just can't handle it. Rob, thoughts on that? Feelings on that? It's powerful stuff. And sometimes things resonate with me. We had a show a couple of times ago we were recording and I stopped and said, hey, that's me. And you immediately jumped right on that, for which I am eternally grateful because mm. I understand a lot more about my authentic self. Mm. I think we had an episode that we were just taping last week where it was so bad. I remember who it was, too. It was um, uh, Isaiah and the abuse and being beaten with a two by four that had nails in it and so forth. And you had to take a moment. What what's it like for most people? I'm in this shit every day. And so for me, it's just, this is what I do. It would be like, you know, somebody works with computers. I, I, would, I would start feeling sad and crying if I had to go in and try to fix a computer. Uh, emasculated in the first five minutes. What's it like, do you think, for a lot of people to listen to these stories? Like you say, Sven, when you have an emotional reaction, if you keep in it and in it and in it, occasion, it eventually loses its charge. Mm. But for the rest of us who don't listen to this all the time, it's a very powerful thing. And it's sometimes very hard to deal with mm. because we're not used to it like you are. So my hat's off to you. I'm not stroking you. I don't know how you do it. But well, good for you. Well, and you sat through uh, and been a part of and had to edit, go back into a 200 plus however many episodes we've done. Um, so you you get to live it and relive it. Can anyone experience that and not be changed? Uh, uh, hopefully for the better, my man. Hopefully oh, for the better. yes, indeed. Well, speaking of trauma and speaking of responses and emotional charges, tell us about Eric, if you would, please, Rob. Certainly, Sven. Eric wrote into us and said, I was born to a physically and emotionally abusive mother who was an extreme taker. She became more and more upset with me as I got older and more out of her control. I believe the only reason that she didn't kick me out of the house at age 13 like she did with my older siblings is because I was a completely blind kid. The social security check that I got every month funded her drug habit and made it so she didn't have to work. I was never a bad kid by any means, but I've seen her for who she was since I was 12. And since then, I've never wanted much to do with her. I cut her out a few years before her death in 2019. In my journaling, I have now started expressing a shit ton of hatred and anger toward her and others, including an absent father. To top this all off, I've been grieving what I believe to be the death of a lifelong dream driven by the fuck you path and am now pursuing what I believe to be the third path. I feel as though I am on the right path to healing and would just like to know if I am. Okay. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. It's great having you on this show. Um mm-hmm. First of all, I want to say, uh, wow, what a path. What a life you have lived. Uh, completely blind, a mother with a drug habit, funding her habit with a social security check because uh, you were, well, blind. Um, she was physically and emotionally abusive. 
and then also a father who was um, distant, uh, absent, and <laughs> absent, yeah, absent, absent. <laughs> okay. And uh, yet one of the things that Rob left out of the write-up on you, um, and I'm going to include it, he wrote a note for me, uh, optional, um, and, it's, and you said, since her death, I stopped myself from expressing my hatred for her and everyone else, including people who I thought I had to protect from her, but who I now realize should have protected me, laboring under the false assumption that, well, she's gone now, letting that shit come up anymore is only poisoning yourself. So in that paragraph that um, they gave to me as optional, you basically said that I stopped myself from expressing the hatred towards her, but then you said in the paragraph he did read, um, I've now started expressing a shit ton of hatred and anger towards her and others, including an absent father. So if I'm hearing you correctly, she dies in 2019. You're like, fuck it. I'm turning off the spigot. I'm not going to feel, express any hatred, any anger towards her or anyone else. And then, but very, very recently, um, you've started letting it out. Is that accurate or inaccurate? Definitely accurate, I would say. You are basically say, explaining that, you know, you shut off all the hatred and then very recently you turned it back on, allowed yourself yes. to feel it. And just, I, I'm just curious, what fundamentally is the reason that you chose to turn it back on, that you're allowing yourself to journal it? Is it that you couldn't keep it in or was it like an actual choice? Why are you expressing it now? Funnily enough, it was because I came across you. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine, well, I told a friend of mine, I said, I told my best friend for 12 years, I told her, uh, or of 12 years, we're still going strong. I told her, I said, man, I fucking hate podcasts where people just talk all the goddamn time. It's the most, it's the most just, just abhorrently nonsensical, most boring thing ever. Cause people always get off topic. And she goes, yeah, the only podcast I listen to is the badass counseling show. I said, what the fuck is that? She goes, oh, it's this guy, he gets to curse. He's a counselor. I said, no shit. Um, as somebody who, as somebody who wanted to go into, uh, or who wants to, you know, go into counseling, uh, others, I, and I have a terrible mouth myself. I said, well, no shit. So I originally turned you on just to hear obscenities come out of your mouth, quite mm. frankly. But then, <laughs> but then, uh, I, uh, actually I listened to, you know, exactly what you started saying. And I was like, oh. Fuck. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm hooked. This guy makes sense and he doesn't sugarcoat shit. Like a lot of, like some people will, I prefer directness always have. So I said, God damn, this is the person who, you know, says what needs to be said. So I went, um, that evening, as a matter of fact, not even 12 hours, not even 24 hours after having listened for the first time and, uh, bought the love cup book and began doing, uh, the exercises, quite frankly, that night, it was about two in the morning. Um, and so all the feelings and, started coming up then. Oh okay. yeah. I had no trepidation whatsoever when it came to, you know, I've heard you say hundreds of times, you know, people shy away from the initial questions of what was this worst moment? What was that worst moment? I was like, fucking finally, someone's asking what I want to be fucking asked. Okay. Mm. I've been dying to get this out for years and no one would fucking listen. But mm. now here we go. Mm. So I was not uh, trepidatious at all. I was, I was ready. And so let me ask you then in your, uh, so you've begun letting it out and you've sort of divested yourself of the belief that oh boy, if she's gone, then I can sort of stop uh, poisoning myself with the hatred. You realize that that doesn't quite work that way. And I applaud you for doing that. And uh, let me ask you then, and you say that, you go on to say, I've been grieving what I believe to be the death of a lifelong dream uh, driven by the fuck you path. In other words, and for those who don't know what that is, it's when we're engaged in a life where we're trying to prove ourselves to someone, usually a parent, or we're doing the opposite of what they might have wanted us to do, or we're doing it to show that, you know, I say, I'll show you, whatever it might be, that's sort of the path to fuck you. It's the path of the rebel who's pissed off, who's taking whatever you say they should do and they're doing the opposite or they're doing something else, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the authentic path. And then Eric goes on to say, um, and now I'm pursuing what I believe to be the third path, but you said you're grieving what you believe to be the death of the lifelong dream. 
what was that dream that you are grieving uh, the death of? Ah, uh, now we get to the meat of the matter, so to speak. So I, I've been an entertainer my entire life. I've taught myself how to sing in five different languages. Um, I went to school for entertainment, theater, all that shit. That was my bachelor's. Um, I spent five years on that. And then I got out and I realized... A, with as politically driven as everything is in a lot of entertainment, I just, man, I'd be around that all the time. And B, um, I just, there's a lot of the hobnobbery and rubbing elbows and okay. being around people. And I'm just like, fuck, that's a lot of late nights for. So you decided to, so you decided to let that go, to walk away. Is that where you're going with this? Uh, yes and no. Yeah. Um, I decided to let it go as far as, cause anytime I pursued anything entertainment related, for instance, right. Whether I sang at a friend's party or whether I, uh, put something up on YouTube or what have you, I always had it with the dream in mind. I said, all right, this, this is one step closer. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep going. Let's keep, but then I just kind of realized, fuck, like this is causing more of a drain than it's, uh, then it, you know, this is causing more of a drain than it does any type of growth. What and was the so, drain? What was the root of the drain in one sentence or less? Why was this thing that you love doing causing a drain? Because we have a lot of people pursuing a dream or pursuing a path, reaching or realizing, fuck, this is draining me in one sentence or less. What really was the drain, Eric? The drain really was that I was telling myself, hey, if you want to be an entertainer, this is what you went to school for. Get yourself good enough, semicolon. This is still one sentence. However, I <laughs> also uh, labored under the assumption of, well, this is what you did for yourself. This is what you spent so much time on. And if you don't allow yourself to, if, if you don't do this, uh, if you don't do the work to, you know, get what you want, then really what good are you? And what have you left yourself fit for? Um, was, was really kind of my, my thought process. So if you don't do this, what are you good for? Okay. So, so then you chose to walk away because it had been a drain and, and so what ultimately very often we pursue paths for reasons other than the path itself we may enjoy parts of the path but we're doing it as you know as the book talks about as a fuck you to someone or as a you know to rebel against someone and so forth and so if you had had success in that field if the mm -hmm. success had come easier or faster or if it had just come what would mm -hmm. that have given you what really was it because it wasn't the the work itself the music itself because uh, you you can keep doing that. It was if you had gotten that success, then what? What would that have given you? Would that have been the ultimate fuck you to mom, to dad for not wanting you, for mistreating you, for rejecting you, for treating you like shit? What would it have, have given you if you had gotten that success? That would have been the fuck you to a lot of people. That would have been the fuck you to my mother. Oh, it's just a hobby. That would have been a fuck you to so many people in society that have, because of the lack of vision, just been like, oh, good for you, sweetie. Um, that would have been a fuck you to uh, a, a lot of fucking people. Anyone who said that, oh, it's a pipe dream. You're not going to do it. You're not right. going to get it. Right. You got to start out younger. You're in high school. You're not starting out younger. Yada, yada, so yada, it's yada. like, I'm going to prove it to you. Fuck you guys. I'm going to prove it. So it was really, to some degree at least, I mean, surely you love music and entertainment. I'm not disputing that. But it was, it was, there was a lot of spite in there. It was like the desire to prove my worth, the desire to rub your fucking nose in it when I prove yep. my worth, the desire yep. to outshine all of you and fuck all of you. So there, it was largely spite driven. Would that be accurate or inaccurate? 50 50 with attention it oh, was sure. driven out of well i mean if that's any entertainer we love attention um <laughs> not me uh, eric not me <laughs> go ahead bullshit. you're right no you're right um, you're right, you're right. <laughs> how could you outgrow that then what happened to the spite what happened to the desire for attention 
um, where did that go? Or did it get outweighed by the, the heaviness of the path? It just got outweighed by everything. Um, for instance, right, there was a uh, production that I had to be in for uh, my senior uh, capstone course in college, right? Mm -hmm. And it was either put on your own one-person show, which quite frankly, I would have enjoyed a lot fucking more, or be in whatever upcoming productions there are. Either way, you're required to audition. If you don't uh, get into the productions, therefore you default to doing your own show which I would have had a lot more fun with, like I said, but I was in a production and this woman was, how, how, sh how shall I say this? The, the director was of a different generation. She was, uh, you know, mid to late seventies, uh, almost in her, almost in her eighties. And her view of somebody who couldn't see wasn't, Oh, uh, you know what you can do. So therefore I'll trust you until, uh, until you give me a court, until you give me a course of reason not to. Um, it was very much, I'll give him the smallest, or at least it felt that way. At least I'll give him the smallest part, um, because he needs a capstone and it's a small enough role to where he can handle it, but he's not gonna. So be, it was fucking insulting as that. shit. And you, you, you know, one <laughs> exactly. more person standing in your way and so on. And so in the end, ultimately, you chose to walk away from the path of being an entertainer. Yet, yes. when I brought up this notion of grieving a path and uh, you said, well, this is sort of the crux of the issue. But before I ask you, well, what's the actual crux of the issue? You said, I've been grieving what I believe to be the death of a lifelong dream. And if, in fact, you are still grieving, then what is left to grieve at this point? And what what really are we talking about here? Um, you know, it's, it's funny you ask that because um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, I just came to this revelation with the dream a couple weeks, a couple weeks ago, about a month, month and a half ago. Fair. Not too long ago. Um, and I was listening to, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the score of My Fair Lady, but I was listening to my, to the score of My Fair Lady, which at the age of 15 would have just, I would have been in heaven. I would have been in dreamland. I would have mm, loved it because right. Henry Higgins was always, well, Henry Higgins was always my dream role on stage. Fair. So, um, uh, I always wanted to be Rex Harrison in that regard. And right. I listened to it and I realized, I just, I felt nothing. I was like, hmm. fuck, hmm. okay. Hmm. So you don't even envision yourself on stage as Henry Higgins any longer. Oh, wow. This really, this, this really must be it. Wow. Um, it's one of the, it's like you said, Duviet, you'll know. Yeah, Duviet, And right. Duviet. And yeah, I kind of knew, I was like, you know, at the very least to the degree that, I had it. I said, all right, it's, it's, that's it. Fuck. How does this feel? Shit. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and how did it feel? And in a, well, as anything will, it was bittersweet. Mm. Um, it was liberating at the same time that it was soul crushing. It was more liberating than soul crushing to mm -hmm. tell you the truth, because I tried stand up for a little bit about a year ago and most stand-up comedians, I fucking love them, but they're just fucking wild off stage. Goddamn, too much for me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I can't do it. Far too much, uh, too much there for me. Um, and it's a hard medium. I've tried it. it. It's is. a very difficult oh, it medium. Is. Okay. It and is. so you yeah. tried that. And so, and so, what? What ultimately then is still being grieved? Is it letting go of the fame, or is it the notion that now I don't have a way to say fuck you to the world? What ultimately are has is yet to be grieved with regard to this old dream? I mean, come on, you invested five years of college, and this has been the dream since the child. What ultimately is still left to grieve with regard to this? I wouldn't necessarily say at this point, because when I wrote you that, I, I wrote you that about what, two months ago now, a month and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and so since then, you know, I've thought about it and I've kind of come to the decision that if I was going to do anything entertainment related, it would be something that I kind of started and took charge of. Got it. Um, Got it. So, so what's the new dream? What captures your attention now, Eric? 
Um, honestly, uh, <laughs> I was really, really deep down. Um, I was really down in a severe just depression back in May. It was horrible. I was just, I couldn't get myself, you know, up and at him and whatever. And because I was thinking, I was like, well, shit, this is the death of what you really want to do with yourself. What mm-hmm. am I fit for? What mm-hmm. have I left myself fit for? Mm-hmm. And I looked up, well, what can you do with a theater degree? And I found drama therapy. And I was like, what the fuck is this? So <laughs> hmm. I uh, went down a rabbit hole and I uh, realized, I said, shit, maybe you don't have to give everything up, you know, entirely. A, you want to help people. Uh, B, you you know, you just naturally do have that flair, so to speak, or so I've been told. C, uh And it's not making you feel like it's a waste of what you've already invested five years of your life in. Hmm. Um, So it's sort of a win-win. As a matter of fact, I'm in the midst of applying for uh, grad school. Really? Congratulations. Yes, as a matter of fact. But, and this is actually what I wanted to talk with you about uh, today as I was thinking about it. And I'm sorry if I'm deviating, but... Um, before you say it, I, before you say yes. it, what yes. you're considering, I, I cliffhanger, more to come. But right now, let's take a quick break. I'll be right back. I've been doing some real healing work in my life, and I mean hardcore. But I've been craving something new to level up. A friend of mine told me about this badass counselor. I got to admit, I rolled my eyes. Then I watched a few of his videos, and yes, this is the guy. I went and got his audiobook, Badass Wisdom. Holy shit. Absolute ass-kicking, inspiring, deep, powerful shit, period. If you don't get this book, you're making a huge mistake. So do you got the guts to go big with your self-care? Go to badasscounseling.com, get the book Badass Wisdom now. This show provides soul counseling intended to entertain and inform and is not medical advice. Now, back to the badass. We are back with Eric. All right, Eric. So take us in. Where are we at? All right. So uh, this is essentially the gist of it now. Now we're all caught up and here we are now. And I've been dragging my ass on this whole grad school application uh, deal just because I've always had that issue of proper decision making. And I know where all of this stems from. I'm curious to see what you think. Um, I've always had an issue with, well, fuck, is this, uh, is this really what you want or are you still using, you know, grad school, helping people as a way to tell yourself, okay, it wasn't a complete loss with your entertainment stuff because you're still utilizing that. B, you're also, uh, making a difference to people. You're being seen, you're getting the attention you want. Um, and uh, C, you're not stuck in, you know, a, a job you don't want to be stuck in for the rest of your life, which is where I currently am mm. at. So is it a matter of are you doing this? Are you using this as another running mechanism or are you do you actually genuinely want this? Because 40000 is a shit ton of money to put towards something if you don't actually want it. That's a great, um, that's an excellent point and a great question. Uh, so let's look at that then, Eric. You had said that, you know, you're, you're sort of dragging your ass on graduate school. And, yeah. um, and then you said, well, is this what I really want? Or is it, um, A, that I'm still using my degree so I can sort of justify having gone and gotten that degree. Um, and I'm making a difference and I get attention and I'm not stuck in a nine to fiver, which is not your thing. Um, what's interesting about those four reasons is actually... Um, I, actually, those are all good things. And you're asking the exact right questions. And you, this is a very common thing. And I'm actually really glad you came on this show, uh, A, because it's a, a fascinating story and a unique set, a con, unique confluence of uh, events and circumstances and the you know shitty parents and all that. Um, and the very legitimate hatred and anger and, and sadness and grieving an old dream. These are all issues that so many people deal with in their own you know unique sort of circumstances. But I like this particular thing right here that I have something that I have an interest in and I may actually really love, but in my decision-making process, I'm finding myself wondering, well, do I really want it? 
Because you think about it, well, shit, if I've gone down a path before and I spent all that money or I spent all that time and energy and I told people I'm going to become an entertainer and it's like, I'm going to be a little gun shy before jumping into the next path. I mean, you can see how there would be a parallel for someone considering a new relationship. Well, shit, I just got my ass handed to me in my last one. It didn't go anywhere. I feel like a fucking loser. Or, you know, my auntie told me that, you know, gee, that was a waste of your time or whatever. So I'm going to be fearful of jumping into a new relationship. Because what if that one goes sour now? I really look like a dumb shit or whatever it is. So you're asking all the right questions, Eric. So if we look at this then, you say, well, do I really want it? Or is it these reasons? Am I, um, a, I'm still using my degree, so I justify that. You know, that's a justification of that. Um, I'd be making a difference, of course, which always brings its own sense of fulfillment. I'd get the attention and I'm stuck in a job. I'm not stuck in a job. But the most interesting of all those is that first one. I'm still okay. using the degree, and you talked about sort of the idea of, you know, <clears throat> let me ask you this, when it comes to the idea of I'm still using the degree, is the desire to still use the degree in a direct correlation, you know, okay, I was in for, the, I was in for entertainment and theater, and now I'm using it in drama therapy. So there's a direct lineage there. Um, is it because, gee, I want to use my degree, or is it because I feel like I should use my degree? Or is it because um, people are going to say, well, why aren't you using your degree? Which is it? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's really funny. Fuck what the people say in terms of why aren't you using your degree? Um, okay. For me, it's, it's, more of, uh, it's more of a personal thing. Um, it's more of a, well, A, I spent all this money or, well, I didn't actually, um, a, um, you know, I got this degree, mm -hmm. um, and you invested B, a lot I, of time and life energy into that degree, time. right. Yes. And life energy. Uh, okay. I invested a lot of time and energy into this degree. B, uh, that feeling of, well, what are you fit for? If you're not a direct entertainer is gone, mm -hmm. but there is still that, come on, man, you know, the stereotypes, out there every single day on one's head in terms of not having fucking vision, helpless, uh, unable to fend for oneself, unable to do this, unable to do that. And that actually brings me to another point. Um, that is still a huge fuck you a lot of the time in my eyes. Is what? that What's the, fuck whole you? the whole stereotype of, uh, well, you know, uh, you're at, you know, a warehouse job or a telemarketing job. And mm -hmm. a lot of people's, and a lot of people's viewpoint on that is, oh yeah, that's, that's all you can do because you can't see shit. Right. So, okay. And you can't see shit, but also, yeah, that's what your theater degree is good for. Good luck with that warehouse job or that telemarketing job. And so, but you bring up this idea of still using it and what is the desire to still use it. You got the degree because you loved the field of study. You got yes. the degree because at the time the trajectory was, and I'm going to go into theater. I'm going to go into entertainment. All right. And so now you realize you don't want to go into entertainment. You don't want to be a singer. And so it's almost like I, if I'm hearing you correctly and you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't mind being wrong. It's almost mm -hmm. like, well, I feel obligated to use it because I invested all that time and energy into it. Accurate or inaccurate? Uh, little yes, little no. So what it is when you get down to bare bones is I do love entertaining. I do love doing voices. I do love singing. I love all of that shit. I just don't want the same starlight and fame and glitz and glamour, which is only about one third of the entertainment industry mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I... The childish dreams of that, the, 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 sh the, the first layer of snake skin has shed itself. I don't want that high level of big Broadway actor, all this shit. I wouldn't mind doing, like I said, a project myself. I will always be an entertainer at heart. That's never going to change. Um, so in a way it is, yeah, I've got to use this degree because I spent so much time and energy on it, but it's also... Well, I might not want it to the degree that I wanted it. I still love doing it regardless of what form it takes. And if I get to help somebody along the way, then why the fuck not? Okay. And all right. So it's sort of in sync with that yet at a, at a, a slight counterpoint to that, but mostly in sync with it. 
my undergraduate degree, I'd started at the Air Force Academy and it was in mathematics and German. My actual, my German instructor at the academy was, had actually been a spy in East Germany. Is the dialects and everything that he knew. And so I had this profoundly effective German instructor. Plus I was a mathematics major at an engineering university. And largely because yep. I didn't want to study aeronautical and astronautical and doubly. E and I still had to take those courses, but I wasn't smart enough for that shit. But I could do a math degree. <laughs> anyway, I uh, ended up transferring out and uh, continuing the math degree. And then I just sort of aborted that, even though I, had, I was like one class short of a major. Two, no, it was two or three. And I just let it go. Anyway, point is, I fell in love with the study of world religions. Ended up getting yep. my undergraduate degree in world religions. Now, I sort of had an inkling that uh, I might be going towards seminary, but I loved this field of study. So I was doing it for the field of study, but then I ended up going into uh, ministry and getting my master's degree in divinity, which included you know all the five languages and all this shit uh, that I added on to it and counseling and all that stuff. And then you know, attempted to make it into ministry. And I was a pastor for a while, but I was always a square peg in a round hole till ultimately in the 2000s, I let go of that. I had invested by that point in, you know, 08, 09, now I'm 41, 42, and I walked away from something entirely that I had invested an undergraduate degree, a graduate degree, much debt, uh, storm and drong and getting thrown out and standing up for gay rights and getting thrown out again and, and all this stuff and my life, uh, you know, and I walked away and it's just like, well, you know, fuck it. If, if this isn't where my life is taking me, it's, it's where it's not where it's taking me. And, um, and I just sort of let it go. And what I did was I trusted that wherever life is taking me, if that is to be a part of the tapestry of my life. Well, it already is. It's 20 years of tapestry. It's part of the color. It's part of the fabric, the texture of who I am. But, you know, I was writing books and so on and so forth. And, and so I've written these books. Well, all of them are fundamentally about beliefs. And I'm not necessarily God stuff, but you and I right now are talking about beliefs, what you've been taught to believe about yourself, what you believe your, your calling is, what your passion is, what your worth is. We're talking about beliefs. So even though we're not talking about God shit, you know, like all my training was in, I'm engaged. Oh, yeah. This is a form of loosely construed ministry. And so mm -hmm. it's trusting, it's letting go that if something doesn't feel right, there's no obligation to weave it into this part of the tapestry. It's trusting that it will weave itself in. My sister got her undergraduate degree in elementary education, and she no sooner got out of college from Gustavus, and uh, she got into business, then she was doing this and that, and she ended up being uh, sort of the right-hand woman to, uh, at, uh, to a big shot at uh, a leather company in the uh, 2000, nine, in the 90s, and in 2000, she was the right-hand woman to the president and CEO of the container store and so on and so forth. And she just had a knack for running shit at a massive level. And, but she's always using that elementary education insofar as you're still interacting with people. And it's still about holding an audience, even when you're running a show and so forth. So that drama is going to be a part of, and the music and all of that is going to weave itself into your life. So what I would ask you is, would you, would you ever choose a path? And I'm not in any way trying to discourage you from this uh, grad school path, I think it's fantastic. Would you ever choose a path, even if it on the surface or immediately wasn't using the drama degree? Um, would you give yourself permission? Uh, would you give uh, yourself permission to do it simply because it felt good and it inspired you and excited you? And I'll just let the whole drama degree go for now. And I'm just going to do this because it feels good to me. And the mere fact that you hesitated and you said, um, oh, fuck, says there is something about walking away from that that excites anxiety inside of you. And what is the anxiety? What is the fear that if you were to walk and just go on a hold, give yourself permission, because it's my life. I'm going to write my own script. And what is it about <laughs> doing that that scares the fuck out of you? Whose voice do you fear if you do that? Come on, Eric. Or no, better yet, better yet, set aside whose voice you hear. Let me ask you this. If you were to do that, regardless of who would say it, if you were to do that, what is the one sentence, no semicolons, what is the one sentence you most fear someone saying to you or thinking about you? If you were to walk away 
from the very thing that you had invested in, you know, that, that drama degree and that path and so forth? What is the one sentence that would hurt the very most if someone said it to you or thought it about you? Mm, shit. Off the top of my head, without having much time to think mm-hmm. about it, I would say, kid, I love you, but fuck, you could have made a difference. Fuck you. Because you're really good at you're really good at what you do. You could have made a difference. You could have made a difference. All right. So it's it's somebody, uh, kid, I love you, but fuck, you could have made a difference. Um, so it's somebody basically being, is it somebody being disappointed in you or you fearing you're walking away from your own talent? Why would that sentence hurt so much? Mainly because it would be a regret of, well, if I had actually fully applied myself and not let what other people think of the whole blind deal um, get in the way and actually get yourself out there and do it, then, you know, Christ only knows what could happen to you. Um, But... So wait a minute. So two things. So you're saying then that you got out of it because of the whole blind thing. Whereas a minute ago, you were talking about how, you know, you fucking were no longer inspired by Henry Higgins. So which the fuck is it? Both. Because I got out of it. I stopped the stand up because I was like, fuck, I don't want to get applauded for just walking in a room. Oh, good. The boy can breathe on his own. Mm -hmm. Um, But Also, it was, that was part of what kind of had me lose my inspiration, not to mention another thing that actually caused, this might give you some more context, another thing that caused uh, me to really want to follow it as heavily as I did in the first place was, you know, I was seeking fucking attention at the, I was 13 when I first started doing theater stuff and I wanted attention. Um, My mother was at the time, in jail uh, Mm -hmm. constantly. And I never knew who I was going to come home to if I was coming home to anyone at all. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of the time it was just, fuck, well, kid's not getting the attention he wants at home and fuck the academics. Why do I have to learn math? Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) So I was a choir student, but I wasn't getting the attention I wanted there either because she spent a lot more time with the advanced choir than us. And but I'm, I'm trying to determine why you walked away from the degree is it or from drama. Uh, I'm trying to determine, you know, someone saying, right. kid, I love you. You could have made a difference. That would hurt the very most because why? Because... Perhaps while I have no interest in stage, public stage things any longer, anything on stage, it's not entirely off the books, but that whole big, you know, big Broadway baby dream is, is, yeah, that's gone. No more stage work. Um, Because, because why? No more stage work because I'm sick of (sighs) underestimation. Okay. And having to having to prove constantly constantly that I can walk across a stage without a fucking cane in my goddamn hand. Okay, let me a- okay, let me ask constantly. this question. Let me ask this question. As a straight, largely straight white male who is six foot four, 250 pounds, who is strong, looks strong, is articulate, has never known what it's like to have a handicap, uh, a disability, who has never known what it's like to be a woman and to live in a man's world, who has never known what it's like to be trans or to be black or to be blind, who has never known any of that. From my perspective, aren't people always, no matter what the fuck you go into, aren't they always going to think, well, hey, the blind kid didn't stumble over himself. You know, aren't they, no matter what you go into, aren't you always going to run into that? I'm asking an honest question here out of my own ignorance. Aren't you in every single field, unless you are just surrounded by a world of blind people, aren't you always going to have people thinking condescendingly of you or just not knowing how to respond? Aren't you always going to encounter that? Sometimes, let me tell you, fella, even in a world of blind people, you're still the lowest on the totem pole. However, I digress. 
What makes show business any different from any other business? Furthermore, can't you capitalize on that? I mean, I think about Louis Anderson, that his opening joke when he began his degree, fellow Minnesotan, that Louis Anderson came out, big rotund man, and he would come out, the microphone is on a stand, and he would take the mic out of the microphone stand. He'd set the microphone stand aside as he said, I'm going to move this so that you can see me. That was right. his opening joke. He's rotund. You can't miss him. The microphone stand right. wasn't. That was his joke. So he was making humor out of the very thing that the very thing people are noticing about him. Holy shit, this guy's a fat fucker. He's making humor out of it. Are you able, were you not wanting to? What I, I'm asking a dumb question. You're seeing it as your deficit that people are looking down at you because of it. How do you turn, whether in, in show business or in anything else, how do you turn what some might think is your deficit into your greatest strength is my question. My thing is, is because, for instance, um, and it's them, it's it's the it's their opinion of it as a deficit that pisses me off, not right. necessarily that I see it. As right. A right. Yeah. And that's um, why I said that they see you at right as having right, 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 right. And I, I shit you not, dude. This is a lot of the time how it will go or how it would go sometimes. Um a lot a lot of the time it would go uh, you know, oh, fucking you walked up onto the stage just fine. Wow. Or I would bend down to grab something. And people will, people have this thing, they'll be overly helpful about shit. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's really genuinely, it's just, it's the constant having to correct uh, people. Obviously I do it politely, um, but it's the constant having to feel like you've got to correct people like, hey, look, I'm not five. Or look, I put this down here for a reason. Leave it where it was. Let me ask or, you this question, Eric. What percent of that sort of, you know, and I have to believe that what you're expressing there is you hate the condescension by which you're treated or the being seen forever as this lesser being who cannot operate in life, you know, fully functionally. It's the yes. sort of view. Of, okay. So of that, that notion that people view me as sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, less than right. that people see me as somehow deficient. What right. percent of you believing that people see you that way, what percent, if you were to be really bone, stone cold honest here, what percent of you uh, knowing, believing that people see you that way is that people actually see you that way? And what percent is something in you that believes people see you that way? In other words, your own past, how much is your own past and maybe your own anger or your own experience? And maybe it's zero, but it's an honest question. What percentage right. is, is your own story, your own insecurities or your own angers playing into this equation? And what percent is it that people actually, that it's that the amount that people treat you that way is big? Is it is it 60% people actually are this way and 40% my own shit? Is it 90% uh, people are this way and it's only 10% my shit? Or is it some other inversion of that? What percent is this really a about your own shit inside of you? And what percent is it that people, that this way people treat you is this oh, gross, overwhelming, big thing? You're smiling I'm a little bit. About. My listeners I'm a bad can't liar. see. That's You're why fucking smiling. Oh, so you want to lie, which means there's an no. ugly fucking truth no, there. So what is the fucking truth, Eric? What percent is this your own shit? Because you just basically said part of the reason I got out of fucking show business is people see me this way, this way, this way. And now you're basically saying with that little wry grin across your face that a lot of it is just my own shit. So you're saying I got out of show business because of my own fucking shit. A lot of it. Yeah. What's the percentage that it's your shit? shit? Well, give me a percentage, motherfucker. Hmm. 75, 25. Ah, now, I love you so much for your honesty, Eric. That is a beautiful fucking thing. I got out of it because of my own shit. And if you were to sum up your own shit, quote unquote, regarding this thing, this how I'm just convinced people are seeing me this way and it pisses me off and it pisses me off and it pisses me off. If you were to sum it up into one sentence that my own shit, quote unquote, what really is your shit that is 75% of this equation that drove you out of fucking show business? What is it in one sentence? What is your own shit? Okay, that is a difficult one. Whilst it may not come as vehemently from others most of the time, 
that 25% that it, of the time that it does come from others is annoying as fuck. And I tend to look more at that 25% and go with it than the rest of the 75% of the people who are just like, hey, you can walk, you can talk, you can breathe, you're fucking fine. <laughs> And what is it that is being conveyed to you in that 25% that hurts so much, that pisses you off so much, that rings in your head, resounds like a clanging drum, bell, gong, whatever? What is the message in one sentence or less that that 25% that whether they are saying it or you hear them saying it, even when they're not saying it, what is the ultimate message in one sentence or less that that 25% is saying that you then expand into 100%? Really quickly, um, I just want to, this is actually, I had stopped journaling about a month ago, um, and this is the reason why, because I didn't want to touch this, so I'm glad that you're pulling at this, because this is what I didn't want to yank up. Okay, and so you I'm clearly so fear this, so. you clearly fear this, so sum up what the message is so, that you are hearing, whether they are saying it or not, or that the, you're hearing it, you're feeling it, and it hurts so much, it hits you so deeply. In one sentence, what is the message of the 25%? They're right. Um, you, it's, it's bigger than you. That's what the message to me is. It's bigger than you. That, that, opinion, that opinion, when it's being expressed, is, is bigger than you because it's a societal opinion. So therefore you're never fully going to be able to escape it. And that fucking stings like All right. a million hornets. <laughs> All right. So in other words, uh, uh, you know, fighting is futile. Do not resist. Fighting is futile. You are destined for failure. What? I, I'm not resonating. I'm not feeling this answer. I'm not saying it's not true or accurate. I just need you to put it in half a sentence in like how a fucking 13 year old say it, use 13 year old language. What <laughs> really is it that you hear these, the 25% the saying, is it that you're a fucking loser and you're always gonna be a fucking loser? Is it, hey, look at retarded no boy. Matter how is good it, what is it? No matter, no matter how good your abilities, you will always be lesser because of this. No matter how good your abilities, you will always be lesser because of this. And you yes. fear that, and you didn't want to fucking journal that shit because why? No. Because you believe because. this to be reality, I, 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 inescapable reality, that no matter how good you are, because you're blind, you are fucked. To a degree. To a degree, my ass. Yeah. You don't want to fucking, yeah. you didn't, you stopped fucking journaling a month ago. Don't give me to a degree. It's so powerful and so overwhelming. And you are so fucking convinced of it that you stopped journaling. I don't want to fucking touch it. Too scary, too hot, too painful. I am destined to fail or at least mediocrity at best. I will never have the fucking success I want because the world is stacked against a fucking blind man. Give me a feeling word. What are you feeling right now? Opened up. Is that a feeling word? We're going to say it is. And sure. Opened and up. how does opened up feel? Vulnerable, terrifying, but necessary. What's the most terrifying part about the realization that somewhere in me, I believe that I'm fucked because I'm blind and I'm never going to amount to shit. There's always going to be a glass ceiling for the blind man. Potential accuracy. Potential? Uh, what the fuck does that mean? You stop journaling because you believe it's full on. What do you mean potential accuracy? If it's just potential accuracy, is it because you fear the potential accuracy is actually accurate? Or yes. what are we talking? Yeah, of course you're going to yes. fear that shit. And so then, uh, and now you tell me if I'm fucked in the head, I won't be offended. And so the mere fact that the, the potential accuracy of that I, I fear that it's high and maybe it's only 25% of the people saying, listen, kid, you know, you could have been something. He could have been a contender, but fuck, he's blind. And so that rings in your fucking head. And so I aborted my fucking dream. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty big part of it. Let yeah. me ask you this. As a you, as your first time up on stage doing stand-up or um, 
I was going to say sit down, but you're not in a wheelchair. You're just blind. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you sitting down on this Zoom call. Yeah. Right, right. There's no wheelchair. All right. So anyway, um, uh, my first time doing stand-up was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I absolutely bombed. All right. I did about a million things fucking wrong. When, as far as your actual comedy, how was it? It was good. I mean, it was beginner. All right. Um, it, it was Which good. you would expect for somebody's people- right. Naturally, yeah. And and I mean, even the, even the greatest of the greats, they're still going to the comedy cellar. They're still going to this club or that to try out new bits, and they have plenty that bump. I guess what I'm getting at, kid, is you know you know more than I do all the success stories of all the blind people in the world. All right, right. there are plenty. Right. right, I was at the graduation of Leslie University in Boston for my stepdaughter when she graduated from art school. And the guy was the first blind man to ever summit all seven um, major summits, major peaks, a blind dude. You're Uh, talking about uh, Weinmeyer, aren't you? That sounds right. Yeah. Eric, whatever the fuck his name is. Right. And so the, the point is, you know, all the stories better than I do of all the people who did not use or did not allow their quote unquote disability to get in the way. But what I'm hearing you saying is a, either A or either A, B or both. A, it's stacked against me and I'm never really gonna do it because I'm always still gonna, it's just gonna be a blind guy. Or B, um, you know, I'll do some great things but I'll never be as great as I wanna be because I'm still just a blind guy. Uh, or or I'll fail miserably and I'll, I guess C, Basically, it's A or B. Either A, I'll only be able to get so high because I'm blind, or B, I'll spend my whole life fighting for something, and because I'm blind, I'll never get anything out of it. So either way, it's kind of a fucking waste. I would say it would have more to do with the first one. Uh, I know my ability. I know what I can do. Okay. It's more so. It's the. It's the. It's not the not knowing that you're good at things. Trust me. I know I'm good at what I. I do. believe it's you. More so the. <laughs> it's the what. It's more it's, 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 it really is. It's that fear of, oh my fucking God, are they right? Oh my fucking God. If you put yourself out there, you're always going to be coddled or this or that or fuck. They're not going to actually see you for who you see you for. But if you stay at this dead end job, you're not going to know anyway, right. regardless of whether it's counseling, and entertainment, so if, whatever. If you go down the path and if there is that glass ceiling, the disabled blind glass ceiling in fucking entertainment uh though obviously i don't need to quote for you the great entertainers who are blind i mean let's just start with stevie motherfucking wonder all right so the whole blind thing you can go fuck yourself on that one because it's it's a bullshit fucking glass ceiling right because i mean you know better than i do all the great entertainers who are blind but so the point is i have this dream and but I'm just afraid of investing my life in it and getting capped because there's a fucking potentially a glass ceiling. Is that what we're talking about here? Is that the real reason you walked away from this fucking dream? Because it seems futile. That was part of the reason. Okay. And then part in, of the real reason. in one sentence or less, then what was the rest of the reason? The rest of the reason was that. I just wasn't feeling stage work and uh, it just wasn't, I just wasn't feeling it mainstream any longer. Like I said, uh, but, uh, but what is the reason you weren't feeling it because you felt like it was futile or I just don't enjoy it as much anymore. One transformed into the other. It was because of one, it was because of the seeming futility That's what that, I'm saying. It, that it created the other. Right. So, and so yes, what I'm saying was, is what if that, what if you did not believe in the futility, would you still pursue the dream? Well, you know, that's actually really funny. Um, you bring that up because ever since I stopped looking at every entertainment thing that I do as, oh, one step higher, one step more, one step more, and actually started just, allowing myself to just have fun and say, fuck it. You know what? If you succeed, you succeed. Great. But if you don't, you're not going to kill yourself over it. Mm -hmm. Um, Once I actually let go of that, that whole putting myself under pressure of fuck. Yep. Underestimation. Fuck. Oh, then what happened? Then what happened? It just, it just, it just became, Oh, uh, this is something you can do for fun. And if, if you get, you know, if someone sees you in it, great. 
Uh, if they don't, then fuck it. You still enjoy what you do. Um, yeah. But you don't have to put any stringent expectations upon yourself. Right. And so th- then the question is, uh, you maybe heard uh, when I, where I've asked this in a video or uh, uh, is many sort of motivational speakers will ask the question, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And that's a great question. Cracks people's thinking open, you know, whether it's astronaut or entertainer or professional hockey player or, you know, I'd be a master plumber and just have a great family. What is it that you would do if you knew you couldn't fail? But I ask a very different question. And I ask the question, what would you do if you knew there was a high likelihood you would fail? What would you do anyway? Because you're going to have setbacks, you're going to have frustrations, you're going to go through droughts. What would you do sheerly for the love of the work? And so, Eric, let me ask you, even if you knew there was a high likelihood you would fail, what would you do for the sheer love of the work? Voiceover entertainment, if it were anything, um, for the sheer love of it, if I started my own project, so to speak. Um, if I got groups together and did what I needed to do, that would be for the love of it, just so that, okay, cool. If I get paid, I don't care. This is this is fun anyway. Um, you know, counseling is another, um, just for the love of helping people um, with A, what I've gone through, and B, being able to relate uh, with an anthropology minor as well, you know, so there is that intrigue into humanity that uh, through all of that, being able to relate to others <clears throat> under certain circumstances, then, uh, you know, really like what where we started at, uh, both of those things are still open. It's just not as astronomically, uh, I'm not shooting for the stars, <laughs> you know, so to speak. That, that dream of, okay, I got to go out every night and I got to do this and I got to do that. You don't got to do shit if you don't want to do it. Right, so, so, you're, so the difference is between the gotta and the yeah. wanta. Yeah. So there's exactly. a path of wanta and there's a path of gotta. Yep. You gotta do this, gotta do that. And so what if you were to just uh, to abort the gottas and just enjoy the wantas? Why mm-hmm. not make a life out of that? And that's kind of what I've that's kind of what I've started doing. Um, because you know, a therapist that I had a little while back, he told me, he said, Look, um, should is not a good thing. I said, why is that? He says, well, because should implies either that you have regret that you didn't do something or that you need to do something right now. Do you want to do it? And if you don't want to do it, for instance, getting up after an eight hour work day and going out and doing stand up, I'm fucking exhausted. I just came to the realization. I was like, fuck, I just don't want to do it. Well, um, I don't should, get up. well I don't yeah, go. should and gotta so, imply an external power source. Right. If it's a should, now I have, Rob and I both have shoulds, you know, we go to the gym and work out, maybe you do too. I have shoulds that I, I should, uh, you know, uh, get some journaling done because I can feel this thing eating at me inside. So that's a different kind of should, where it's something I already want that I'm shoulding. But very often shoulds are, I'm answering to some other voice. Well, if you're going to have a career in entertainment, you should do this. But I, Yeah, but I don't want to do that. Okay, then don't fucking do it. So the path, mm-hmm. so if I'm hearing you correctly, then the path of what I want to do is that I'm making my own stuff, I'm putting groups together, that sort of thing, may, and maybe going down the counseling path. And so I'm, if, you, if I'm hearing you correctly, then the idea of, of going for this drama therapy degree employs uh, some of the things that are actually wantas for me. Yes, definitely, so 100%. Then, so then why wouldn't you do it? What's fear the, of failure. Oh, Once again, yeah, fear and of that, failure. Yeah, and, and so then obviously you fear uh, not just failing, but you fear what people would think if you would fail. And so the one thing not that really would... that, but that's a lot of money. Like, that's a lot of money to put in. What the fuck else you going to... What the fuck else are you going to spend your money on in your life? What the fuck else are you going to spend your money on? Seriously. Honestly, at, at this point, I mean, shit, there's not really any big expenses. Okay. So... Um, and, and, and you know what, my, uh, my girlfriend's ex-husband, wonderful man, French Canadian, he has his master's degree in fine arts and he was doing mm-hmm. it on whatever the, and translating fucking scripts and how it doesn't, sometimes scripts don't translate from one language to the next because you lose concepts and so on and so forth. That's what his degree is in, but he makes his career in computer hardware, blah, 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 while he's out in LA writing scripts. 
and he's part of a, a script writing group and he's part of a writing group and he's doing what he loves and he's paying his bills on the side. He got the degree, not convinced that he could ever make anything out of it. Maybe he did, I don't know. But the point is you go after what you fucking love in life. Otherwise you get to midway down the path and you realize why didn't I? Who gives a fuck 40,000 fucking dollars? What the fuck else are you gonna spend $40,000 on that's gonna be a better, uh, a better fucking investment than your own fucking joy? Yeah. That is true. That is 100% I mean, seriously, accurate. tell me one thing that you would spend $40,000 on that would bring you more joy than studying this. And if this won't bring you joy studying it, what would bring you more joy? I mean, cocaine? What are we talking about here? Nah, I never tried coke myself. It's really, a, it's really, you know, at the age of 27, it's a path of exploration. It's a path of, you know, like you were saying, not this, not this, not That's this, right. not this, not this. So, And can you definitively this, say not this to this degree? No, but I can't definitively say, yes, let's go either. That's the problem. And that's fine. So just journal about all your fucking feelings and trust that when the answer is right, the fucking answer will come. Trust, you got it. That's the hell. Just and just let it go. You don't have to decide on this this year. The fucking degree is going to be in there, and it fucking it's going to always be there. And so your dissatisfaction with this, whatever path you're on right now, is going to grow, and then mm -hmm. you're going to have an idea of well, I want to try this thing next. That path of discovery. Well, it's kind of like what you say, you know, pain being a very good teacher of life Absolutely. lessons and for Christ's sake. I mean, it has, maybe it hasn't gotten bad enough yet. That's right. Where I'm at. That's right. The nine to five hasn't completely crippled me yet to the point where I'm like, oh my fucking God. That's right. Um, That's right. So. so Eric, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been yeah. awesome. Would you um, be willing to stick around for a couple of minutes afterwards for a little overtime? Yes, of All course. Right. All course. right. Thank you so much. You've been a great guest. Thank you. Uh, Rob, any final words? Well, uh, people that are following along on YouTube, such as uh, Tammy says, wow, for a Sven and Eric, you're right on the money. And that, I guess, is the blind truth. <laughs> oh, uh, you just wanted God. to throw that in there, didn't you, Rob? Uh, I was ready. That's it. Hit me with an original one. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. never heard that one before. Today. Right? Today, yeah. right. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show, Eric. Thanks to my team, KC and Roberto, and to all you folks tuning in around the world. Have a kick-ass day. The Badass Counseling Show is strictly copyrighted. No copies may be made without the express written consent of the Badass Counseling Show, LLC. The Badass Counseling Show is produced by Karen Camparelli and Robert H. Friedman. Executive producer, Sven Erlinson. Original music by two-time Emmy Award-winning composer, Trevor Morris. Have a kick-ass day.